What's up, gentlemen? This is Rising Phoenix Podcast, a podcast about how to rise up after your divorce. I'm your host, divorce coach, Michael Rhodes. Let's get into it. Joining me today, I'm excited to say, is Dr. Robert Glover. Uh, Dr. Glover, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? <laughs> what about me? As, as I said, what, you, you're, you're talking to men going through divorce or been divorced. I've uh, been divorced twice myself, so I've uh, been down that road. My my background is that by training, I'm a marriage and family therapist. So I started working with couples probably 40 years ago. So I've, I've worked with a lot of people in distress, a lot of couples in distress. Um, and then I started working on some personal issues in myself when my second marriage was, was faltering 30 plus years ago. Mm. And, um, and basically my then wife said, you either go get some therapy, go get some help, or I'm leaving you. I go, okay, you're the one that's unhappy all the time. You're the one who's always angry, moody, and you know, blah, blah, never wants to have sex. And so I said, okay, I will. And so I actually felt, I, I, Kind of the little bit of the backstory is, is that, you know, uh, of course, my book is my, my first book anyways, No More Mr. Nice Guy. That's probably what I'm, I'm most well known for, unless in singles community, I've written two books uh, for single men as well. Um, but, but so, you know, I, I went to a 12 step group, I joined a men's group, I got into therapy, mainly to figure out why me being a nice guy didn't make my wife happier. Right. You know, I, I I tried to make her happy. You know, I, I gave her everything she wanted. Um, you know, I was really good at avoiding conflict. Well, she liked conflict. So, you know, I, but no matter how hard I tried, we still had conflict. Right. Um, you know, I I didn't realize it, but I withheld a lot from her. Anything I thought that might upset her, might rock the boat, might put her in a bad mood, might make her less um, wanting to have sex. So luckily I fell into some good places where I, I began really looking deeply at myself. I already had my doctorate in marriage and family therapy, but I'd never really done much work on me. Mm-hmm. And I started realizing I had, um, a lot of what I used to call nice guy patterns. I thought if I'm a nice guy, I'll be liked and loved and I'll get my needs met. If I just treat everybody well. Basically I was trying to be different from my father, uh, my mother raised me to be different from my father. She told me that as a boy. I was trying to be different than all the men that I'd heard women complain about. I was trying to be different from the men that I heard the angry feminists of the 60s and 70s complaining about. So I thought if I just, you know, am nice and not like all those bad men, women will respond well to that. Right. And in, in hindsight, what I found is that if you're single, they don't respond at all to you being nice. Um, you know, you don't exist. And if you're in a relationship, you, you typically just get taken advantage of and hurt and um, and end up really not making your partner happy, no matter how hard you try. So as I began working on me and seeing the, 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 the kind of the errors of my thinking and my training and my programming, if I'm just nice, everything will work out well in life. And um, as a therapist, I, you know, I was working with couples and individuals, and uh, I'd started noticing a lot of the men coming to me for couples therapy, either on their own or with their, their girlfriend or, or wife, were saying the same things I, I was saying in my relationship. I'm a nice guy. I'm one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. I treat her better than her ex. I'm raising her kids. I give her everything she wants, you know, it, but it's never good enough. Uh, when's it going to be my turn? She never wants to have sex anymore. She's always in a bad mood. And I thought, wait, I'm not the only one with this kind of, you know, dynamic going on. So I started a no more Mr. Nice Guy men's group probably about 30 years ago, mm-hmm. met every other week and then quickly started another one. And I started writing just chapters, lessons to give these guys of what I was discovering uh, about me, about what I came to call nice guy syndrome. And, um, and, and, you know, these guys and their wives and girlfriends were saying, Robert, you need to write a book. There's a lot of people that need this. Mm-hmm. So over a period of about six or seven years, it, it evolved into a book. It took about three years to get it published. Because mm-hmm. back then, every publishing company we talked to said, oh, we like your book. But our marketing department says men won't buy self-help books. Right. And and that, that was pre-Amazon. Um, and, and so, you know, like how many of you guys listening right now have a shelf of self-help books? Right you behind know, me. They, they, go, they go buy one after, oh, and this book's recommended. You buy that one too. Yeah. And yeah. Men, men buy self-help books. And, oh, and yeah. what, I, what I told the publishing companies or what I told the editors is you don't know the men I'm talking to. They want to be good men. 
they want to live good lives. They, they want to have good experiences in life. And so over the last, uh, No More Mr. Nice Guy came out in 2003. So it's been about 20 years now. Um, since then, I, like I said, I've written two books uh, for single guys, mainly because after 14 years in that second marriage, um, for, probably 14 years too many in that marriage, um, I became single and, and decided, you know, I can go out and just start learn, trying to date and I'll, I'm just going to end up exactly with what I had in my first two marriages. And, and neither of them were particularly satisfying, even though I stayed quite a long time because nice guys tend to do that. We stay way too long. Uh, so I thought I need to learn to how to date effectively. I need to learn how to become a better picker. Number one, pick better women. Not, not, not like better in terms of value, right. but better in terms of a better fit for me sure. to match my values that, that, you know, uh, that, that I like being with and they like being with me. And the second thing I thought I got to learn how to be a better ender. Because uh, if I just go date the first woman I meet, you know, I'm going to stand up exactly where I was before. And so I, I realized that being a good ender covers a multitude of sins of being a bad picker. Because really, that's what dating is, is a, tr a lot of bad picks. You know, sure. you're, you're not supposed to end up with every woman you want to date with. That, that's often how we get into these relationships that we got into that didn't work so well. We probably weren't very good at dating where maybe we were kind of insecure with women. Maybe sure. we've been trained in our childhood and our families, tolerate bad behavior, put up with things that don't feel good to you, just tough it out or try harder. And it, probably a lot of your men listening you can relate to that. Yeah, I just, sure. you know, I, there were qualities about this woman I liked or I wouldn't have married her. I wouldn't have gotten with her. But it seemed like over time, the qualities I liked, the good qualities kept shrinking and the bad qualities that I didn't like that I thought I could get her over or through or we, you, I could live with, right. they kept getting worse, right. right? Probably most of the guys are going, yeah, 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 that was me. I, I liked this about her, but that, that part disappeared. Right. The parts that I didn't like, you know, took over. And so that's where being able to be a good ender and say, this doesn't work for me, it's time right. to move on. And that's where we're, most of the men I work with, and this includes me, really struggle with that part. But yeah. it's essential. Yeah, so, I, yeah. There's, there's me. There's me in a little <laughs> bit of a nutshell. Well, uh, a, uh, and I'll, I'll probably say this more than once. Thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. Um, so I like to define things. So let's define what is a nice guy in your view. What? How do you define a nice guy? Okay. So a nice guy in the way that I look at it. And, and by the way, I, I think another thing why publishers maybe were a little bit leery of no more Mr. Nice Guys, you know, people pick up a book and say, why would somebody write a book telling men to be not nice? There's already enough not nice guys out there. Right. But, but you know, the, the book, you know, the title is a certain, you know, it takes a phrase that we're all familiar with. No more Mr. Nice Guy. I'm not taking it anymore. Right. Um, and applying it to men that in their lives go, I'm a nice guy. Right. We, we define ourselves as that frequently. So a nice guy is I define it is a man who at a very early age, we're talking a few weeks old, few months old, few years old, inaccurately internalized a belief about themselves, that they weren't good enough, that there's something wrong with them, they're defective or unlovable. The, the technical term for this is toxic shame. Mm -hmm. So toxic shame is an emotional belief, not necessarily thinking. Now thinking often gets layered on top of the emotional belief. Sure. But when a child, is born. We were all completely dependent, helpless, naive, under-functioning. The parts of our brain, the only parts of our brain fully developed at birth were the parts of around survival, mm -hmm. uh, fight, flight, freeze, respiration, heartbeat, need to eat, need to sleep. The parts around reasoning didn't start developing till several months later and don't finish developing in men till about age 25. That's why our car insurance goes down. Our reasoning ability goes up and we quit doing quite so many stupid things, especially behind the wheel of a car. True. Um, so we were born in this very dependent, needy place. And we had lots of painful experiences. Everybody does. Even if we grew up in good families, mm. um, if we were hungry and didn't get fed, that was painful. If we were cold and didn't get wrapped up, that was painful. If we were lonely and didn't get held. That was painful. If we had a bellyache, an earache, a, whatever. All those things were painful, and every child by nature is narcissistic. 
They're the center of their cosmos. So they internalize beliefs. Now, belief's actually not the best word because they don't actually think it. They feel it. No. There's something wrong with me. I caused this. No. And so every human child, without the, without the access to a reasoning part of their brain, only an emotional brain, starts trying to manage these painful, uncomfortable, life-threatening situations. And they do that by trying to medicate their feeling states in the moment. Uh, I sucked my thumb till I was in kindergarten. I think mm -hmm. maybe I was medicating some emotional states. Maybe babies eat. Maybe they cry. Maybe they wet on themselves. Maybe they sleep a lot. Maybe they become needless and wantless. But they're trying to manage those uncomfortable feelings right now. The second thing that every infant tries to do, and many animals do this. I've, I've got a three-year-old pit bull. Dogs do this as well. They manage their uncomfortable feelings, but they also try to prevent those uncomfortable feelings from happening again in the future. Sure. And, and again, doing this with a really immature brain and a really immature nervous system. So every human does this. Now, nice guys do it in their own particular way. And what that usually looks like is this toxic shame and maybe heightened states of anxiety inside of us. Nice guys try to do two things. And this does apply to women as well. There's a lot of nice girls out there. I think, I think most nice guys I know got trained to be nice guys by nice girl mothers. You know, that seems to be shifting. Now, a lot of young men I work with had nice guy fathers and, you know, bitchy, controlling, you know, terrible mothers. Right. Um, so, you know, the, 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 it seems to be shifting somewhat. But what every nice guy tries to do is, is twofold. Number one, if I can just become what I think other people want me to be, then I will get loved and liked and get my needs met. So right. we're chameleons. We're, we're, we're always checking. What do I have to do to please this person to get value? The second thing nice guys do is we try to hide anything about ourselves that might get a negative reaction from the people around us. The things that nice guys tend to hide the most is their needs and wants and their sexuality. Because we're afraid if I have needs, if I have wants, if I'm, if I'm a sexual creature, people will respond negatively to that. I'll get hurt. I'll get punished. I'll get shamed. So nice guys walk through life beginning early, first few months, first few years of life. It really gets um, amped up in adolescence when you know, we want to start fitting in and belonging and being noticed by the opposite sex. And we have to figure out how to do that. Oh, I'll just become what I think everybody wants me to be, and I'll hide anything that might get a negative reaction. So right. it gets reinforced. We bring that into adulthood, and that becomes our, our operating system for life. Now, how I explain that is those internalized beliefs, those inaccurate emotional beliefs. Again, they're not intellectual. They're emotional. They're in a part, a very primitive part of our brain that operates purely on emotion. They become our machine language, our operating language of, of our emotional nervous system. Everything else in life is apps that run on top of it. So how we interact at work, how we interact with family, how we interact with women, how we interact you know, in, in, in various situations with, with other guys are just the apps running on top of that, that primitive machine language that says, I'm not good enough. I'm unlovable. I'll be found out. I have to be, I have to be what I want other people to, to what other people want to be. I have to hide myself. And, and so we walk through life trying to get our needs met while all the time not being real, not being authentic, never being vulnerable, uh, not taking risk, hiding things that, that we think people might react negatively to. And, and then we wonder, well, how come I don't feel more likable? How come I don't have more love in my life? How come I don't have more friends? How come I'm not as successful as I think I could be? Well, primarily because we're working from this paradigm that says, I can't be me. I got I to gotta be what I think they want me to be, and I got to hide this. That's, that's, that's a, uh, a really emotionally burdening way to try to go about living life. But right. a lot of men are doing it. I've tried to do it for many years. Yeah. And so one of the questions I was going to ask, one of the things I was going to ask is how much of this comes from childhood? Clearly, I think uh, probably all of it, or, or at least a very large percentage of it. So I guess then the question for me becomes, can you address your shit, your issues, your dysfunctions, your weaknesses without addressing your childhood? Um, yes and no. Yes and no. Uh, that's a good question. I, I'm, I'm a therapist and, you know, um, by training, but probably more like a coach in, in how I practice. 
Uh, and again, I've, I've been working with, with men exclusively for over 20 years, both in, in groups, individual works. I just started a virtual workshop last night that will go for six weeks. So um, I, I've been working with men for years now. And in my work, we do both often. We'll, we'll, we'll go back to the past. We'll, 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 we'll look at what created our internal belief systems. And we'll also look at what's not working right now, which is usually the best window of the path I know, best path or window to our past that I know of. Sure. And that's usually where I start, guys, with individual consultation. I go, what's not working right now? Is it relationship? Is it sex? Is it money? Is it work career? We dive into that. And usually we find in the, in the past, inaccurate beliefs we internalized, experiences we had that maybe were traumatic, our defense mechanisms, our neuroses that, that, that developed in, path, in the past. Now, I don't, I don't believe we can actually even completely uncover everything that has contributed to who we are. A lot of who we are is just natural temperament. I'm a fairly naturally easygoing guy. I, I don't like conflict in general. Um, I like to be liked in general. Um, that's me. Right. That's me. Now, that set me up in many ways to then interpret my life experiences through those those natural temperament ways of avoiding conflict and trying to get light and you know, those things. So a lot of nice guys have that natural temperament. Now, there's also a number of nice guys and, and no more Mr. Nice Guy talk about two types of nice guys, what I call the I'm so good nice guy and the I'm so bad nice guy. I thought most of the I thought most nice guys were probably like me. I'm so good. I'm one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. What I had done is I'd taken my, my toxic shame and locked it away in a really tight compartment and layered on top of that all the things I did that I thought made me a good guy, right? But it was still a reaction to toxic shame. So all I could see was everything. I, I've got this great bank account of all these good things that, that I do and who I am. Everybody should like me and love me. Nobody should ever get mad at me or you know right. uh, tell me I'm wrong. Right. On the other hand, what I call the I'm so bad nice guy was the 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 child or young boy that seemed to get off the rails early at a young age, maybe ADD, ADHD. They were in trouble at school all the time, couldn't pay attention. They were told they were stupid, maybe grew up in an alcoholic family. If they had ADD, ADHD, they probably had family members that did. They probably drank to manage it, uh, maybe abuse issues, sexual trauma, and they start acting out at an early age, drugs, alcohol, sexuality, dropping out of school, fights. And they internalize a lot of talk. I'm bad. I'm in trouble all the time. I'm right. stupid. I, I can't do anything in school. Um, that, okay, I'm so bad, nice guy. Now, what happens with these guys, The either because of like ADD, ADHD, addictions, an oppositionally defiant personality type by nature. Like I said, I'm, I'm compliant. But there's others that are oppositionally defiant. It's just temperament. It's what sure. we're born with. So these guys go through life piling the shame on. Oh man, I you know I, I I'm doing drugs. I I'm ending up in jail. I got to go to twelve steps. I got to go to treatment. You know I'm I'm you know I'm I'm bankrupt. Right. Until something happens, they go in the military and kind of get straightened out. <laughs> they find twelve steps or get straightened out. They, you know, get into a relationship and get straightened out. They have a child and, you know, and then they say, I got to straighten my life out. And they, and they do, but right. And so they go, I'm, I'm going to become a good, a better person. I'm going to become a good person. I'm going to become a nice guy. But right beneath that is that all that memory of all the fuck ups, how, right. how, you know, and, and so they, 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 they live with two things. One, I'm one slip away from just slipping back into all that, that fuck up. And. I can't let anybody see who I really am because if they know how fucked up I am, they're going to hurt me or leave me. So we're, we're, we're pretty guarded and we do, and they do all the nice guy stuff. So one nice guy, not aware of his shame, just thinks everybody should like me. I'm great. Right. The other one is fully aware of his shame and goes, oh, if anybody finds out, they're going to leave me. So both of these men are, are trying to negotiate their way through life, through, through relationship. And this is where it does tend to show up the most. In relationship, you know, I'm, I, like I said, I've worked with single guys enough now. I, I, I went through about a 10, 12 period, year period of being single, of dating and having some relationships, but living alone and being single. I, I am married again. I've been married for almost seven years. Um, 
with nice single nice guys, kind of the, the meme is, you know, women all say they want a nice guy, but they don't want me. Right. Uh, you know, they, they tell me, oh, you're, I, I end up in the friend zone. They say, you're such a nice guy. Some lucky woman will be so lucky to have you someday, right, right. but they don't want me. Right? right. So, so trying to be nice does not attract women in general. Now it'll attract broken women that have been with a lot of assholes, right. but those broken women will come be with the nice guy and just take control and just walk all over it. And I'm not blaming the women. That's just, that's just how, how the system works. Yeah. yeah. Where it shows up in relationship is guys, you'll say, my wife never wants to have sex anymore, or she's always angry. No matter how much I give, it's never enough. I, I can't make her happy. Um, and then, you know, uh, they end up where, where these guys are that are listening to, to this podcast is that, okay, she cheated on me. You know, it just became intolerable. I couldn't take it anymore. And, and probably, you know, again, a lot of your guys are probably like me, you know, nice enough that I can't end it. That would make me a bad guy. That would make me a bad person. It will devastate her. We have kids, we have debt, we have a house. We, we made a commitment to God, dude. you know, we have family where you were, all of this gets intertwined goes, I, I, I can't walk away from that. I can't leave it. Even though if any of your guys listening were like me, I've spent most of my marriages, my first two, I've been married well over 30 years between three women. And I've, until the, my, my most recent marriage, I spent most of the years in those relationships thinking about, I wish I wasn't here. You mm -hmm. know, how, how can I get out? Um, but not getting out, because mm -hmm. again, not, not a good ender. And because mm -hmm. that, that would be not nice. Right. So, and I, you know, I've often said that all of my marriages have made me more unhappy than happy. Now, with that said, I'm really grateful for the women I've been married to and for the relationships I've had besides my marriages, because they got me on a path of learning about me. And, and it was a big stick upside my head that woke me up. Like, like in 12 step programs, you'll hear a lot of like recovering alcoholics say, I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. And you say, well, grateful? Why? Alcohol, well, it destroyed your life. No, it woke me up. My nice guy patterns and relationship woke me up. And, and, and gave me a pathway to live a life more on my terms, with more consciousness, and truly be a good man, not a nice guy. And being a good man doesn't mean I'm trying to make everybody happy or please them or get their approval. Being a good man says I live with integrity. I'm honest. I'm transparent. I live life on my terms. Um, and people can either come join me in that or, or don't. That, that's fine. Yeah. So... As I said, that's where, where these nice guy patterns tend to show up a lot is in relationship. They show up in work and career, hidden secretive behaviors with alcohol or marijuana. I work with a lot of men that have porn compulsions, sure. gaming, gaming compulsions, wasting time surfing the internet compulsions, Netflix compulsions. So a lot of nice guy patterns show up in just that not living up to our full potential and just wasting a lot of time. So how, how I mean, how important is it? Then I mean I, I just think it's essential to and actually hang on one second because I gotta plug my fucking laptop in or this is gonna be a quick interview. Um, how important is it to to look back though? Like I I, I think yeah in, in, I kind of yeah I guess before, I, I but, probably did, I probably didn't fully answer that question. Did well I? I think well I think you said it's it's you need both and I and I agree with that but I think um, I think it starts there. I think you have to be able to look back and understand. The, the dynamics um, of, of your childhood that led to some of these things, because right. these things, your, your behaviors don't come. That's not a vacuum, right? They, 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 they developed for a reason. Like you are behaving a certain way. And I think it's, I think for me, it takes the pressure off of the individual to understand a little bit better. Like, Oh, I'm not, I'm not a nice guy because I'm, I'm weak. It's because the patterns that I developed, yeah. the tools that I was given. So, I mean, I think it's essential, but it leads me to a question um, because you, you know, obviously you've done a lot of work on yourself. What, what is the relationship like with your parents? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know if, you know, they're still around, but what was it like and what is it? Did it evolve? Did it develop? Did you have a hard time sort of reconciling what they may have done and, and how it contributed to some of your dysfunctions? What was your rela sure. relationship like with them? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I've spent 30 plus years looking at that. Sure. Um, and because, you know, I, I got into therapy in my early 30s, again, when my second wife said, you got to go get help. Yep. And luckily, I got with some good therapists. And, um, and, and as I said, therapy is often looking back. And 
So the reason why I haven't given you a clear answer to this is that there, there, in my mind, there isn't one. As I said, you know, the, 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 the age old debate of nurture versus nature, sure. you know, are we who we are because we were born that way? Are we that way because we were influenced by our environment to be that way? I don't know that anybody's got that one nailed yet. Uh, I mean, we've been debating it for centuries. Yes. Um, I will add, the older I get and the more I work on me and work with people, I keep leaning more and more and more in the nature direction of things that we really? were, we're, we're born with a temperament. Yeah. You know, if you raise more than two, two children or more, you start seeing temperament at a really, really early age in children. You know, they pop out with the temperament. And you start realizing that it is probably our temperament that influences how we view and deal with our early life experiences. Because especially as a marriage and family therapist, you know, I've looked at a lot of family systems and you'll see children in the exact same family system grow up with pretty much the same experiences. Other variables come in, sure. uh, birth order, gender, um, just how many kids were ahead of them or behind them, you know, yeah. uh, where their parents happen to be at when they're born. You know, I've, I've worked with some people that, you know, they're 20 years younger than their next oldest sibling. So, you know, by the time their parents had them, they were old, you know, but their other siblings, you know, had a different life experience, but, or, and I really think the temperament goes a long way to determine how the environmental factors affect us. Cause I, most families I've looked at, if there's more than one kid and if there's a nice guy or a nice girl, there's also a, a not nice child in there. There's usually an acting out child. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you were acting out a lot as a, a, a child and young man, and if you had a brother, odds are that brother would take 180 degrees different path to not be like you. He would be the compliant one, the one that didn't rock the boat, that wasn't a moment's problem. So I've seen the same families turn out, you know, with a very similar environment for the children, turn out children that went completely different directions. This one goes off into, you know, addictions and depression and early suicide. And this one becomes a PhD and a scholar and lives an exemplary life. Right. Okay. What makes the difference? Wasn't the environment, because the environment was pretty similar for both. But I think the temperament determined how we dealt with that. So you can't separate them. Now, does our early life experiences affect us? Yes, completely. Part of the problem, and again, I'm not, I'm not, I, I agree with you, but I'm throwing out some side points. Yeah. I think that I, I'm, I'm a therapist by training. I think therapy is valuable. I've done a lot For of sure. therapy. Absolutely. At 67 years old, I'm still trying to put pieces together yeah. from, you know, I, I, I was, I was just kind of just a day or two ago, just contemplating. All right. You know, my, my father was as negative, critical, unpredictable mood but yet i loved him he taught me to play ball we went camping we went fishing you know I, I i i loved him but he was unpredictable and moody and critical my mother on one hand felt safer to me but in hindsight now i mean because she's still alive my father's been dead since 2009 my mom's still alive she had a stroke about four years ago so she's somewhat debilitated but still lives alone and i go i, I go visit her as often as i can uh, and and I love her, but I didn't talk to either of my parents for 15 years when mm -hmm. I started doing my recovery because there was too, too much toxic dynamic there. And I look back at my mom and to this day, she can't say I love you if I don't say it first. So I say I say it a lot to her to torment her because <laughs> she will say it back if I say it first. My wife and I have this running joke. Your mother said I love you first. I said, yeah, yeah, she actually did. And, and my wife and I both give her a lot of hugs because she would not give a hug unless someone hugged her. But when I give my mother a hug, she doesn't let go first. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's my mother's stuff. I remember asking sure. my mother and her, my aunt, her twin sister, about two or three years ago. I said, um, what do you guys remember about your mother? And both of them looked at each other and they go, nothing. 
They didn't remember anything about their mother. Their mother apparently worked all the time, was probably less nurturing and affectionate than my mother, right? Yeah, my right. mother, you know, I know went out of her way to do good things for her children. She wanted us to have a good life. She spent time with us. She taught us. Things. That's her love language is acts of service. Mm. Her love language is not hugs and I love you. Right. So that, so I was just, I was just kind of lying on, on my bed the other day thinking, how do those two pieces, mom and dad, I've been working on this for over 30 years. How do those keep unconsciously affecting the choices I make in relationship? I'm still trying to put that puzzle together. Well, I mean, and, I, and, I, yes. and I'm not a, and I'm not a dumb or, or a <laughs> non-introspective guy. I, I think it's the foundation. I, I, I think I, I do think while parents uh, and ch children could be raised uh, in the same environment and have different outcomes is because I, I do think it's, it boils down to the parents and the, they're humans and they're fallible. So they might treat one of kid course. one way. I think, I think, temper, I think temperament and, and, and personality and stuff, I think obviously plays a role. I do think it sort of splits down the middle um, to, to varying degrees. Probably. I think a, a really bad environment will, will, will um, counteract a, a really good uh, nature. Right. So, so if it's a really good bones, so to speak of a kid, but he's raised in, you know, squalor and beaten, then that's going to, it's going to affect uh, that kid, it, it, no matter what, like that, that, that nature, that environment. So, or that, or that nurture um, that environment. So I think, I think it, it, it definitely varies and it can go yeah. different ways, but I do think you have to address it. Um, I, I, I well, think it's well, the sure, foundation cause, cause, of everything. Cause here's the deal. Again, I'm not disagreeing with you. It's just that we can't be quite as black and white as, cause like I've known, I've known people that grew up in the most horrendous environments sure, and they're amazingly well-adjusted people. I've known people that grew up with, every advantage and everything you could have and they they they're, they're as fucked up as you could be yeah, yeah okay so here but here's the deal and one reason why i was contemplating this you know just a couple of days ago is i'm reading a new book from a good friend of mine you you should get him on your podcast Love uh, his name is dr sean t smith he wrote had, a book he's been on your podcast yes sir uh, he's a buddy of mine i love yeah, him Sean's he, good he, guy. He wrote it, you know, Tactical Guide to Women. Yep. And his new book is called Gatekeepers, A Tactical okay. Guide to Commitment. And the main premise is that a man cannot let his romantic impulses and drive to, you know, connect and please with a woman to get in the way of his values and his purpose in life. Yeah. And and he does a really good job addressing it. I, I as I read it, I I, I kind of think, okay. It's, it's, it's kind of like David Data's Way the Superior Man mm. meets um, uh, Rolo Tomasi's, you know, Rational Male. It's right. kind of got a little bit of the, you know, a little red pill, uh, red pill feel to it, but kind of the David Data consciousness thing of you got to put your purpose, you know, first. Yeah. So it's really good. So I've been reading that and, and I'm, I'm really loving it. And again, he, Sean's a good friend of mine. And, and so, um, pondering here's the deal as i said i've been a marriage therapist for a long time and i've always approached relationships uh, i think it was pia melody that said we tend to be attracted to to partners that have the worst traits of both of our parents unconsciously we will recreate in our adult relationships what we experienced as children because it feels familiar to us sure. we dealt with a critical parent we'll probably pick critical partners if we had unavailable parents we'll pick unavailable partners. Therapy is good to help us kind of get handle on that. Yeah. And, but because we do this unconsciously and Sean does a good job of talking about that in gatekeepers about the unconscious dynamics at work. We pick our partners with very little rational input. We, they, something about it clicks. And the way I always put it, when we were a few weeks old, few months old, few years old, we developed tools to deal with the dysfunction, with the with the craziness that we had in our families, you know, sure. even in the families that look really good, often there's a lot of hidden craziness. Oh, right? yeah. So whatever those tools are that we develop, well, I'll I'll get good at you know being the good companion to mom and talking her down and talking her through when she's sad. I'll get good at never rocking the boat with my dad and pleasing him. Those are the tools I've got in my relationship toolbox. I'm going to carry that toolbox into my adult life and the I, I will I'll co-create, I'll attract women to let me use those tools. Sure. Right. Now, if I if I attract a woman that doesn't need my companionship and me needing to listen to her problems, so she, what do I do? I don't know how to relate to that woman or if she's not critical or moody or, or you know, right. not unpredictable. Hey, I got tools for that one. Right. Okay. 
You know, we want to use the tools we learned in childhood. So therapy can be really helpful to help us realize what tools we developed as ch children to survive these intimate relationships and why we developed them and how we're still using them today. Now, there's the one last thing I'll say uh, about the therapeutic process. Again, I'm a therapist. I believe in it. But there are some pieces we'll never get access to. Mm. They're stored up in emotional memory. They're not in picture memory. We don't right. have words for them. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I've done some ayahuasca ceremonies that were really powerful. Nowadays, they're doing a lot of experimenting with M MDMA, with psilocybin connected with therapy, which is opening a lot of doors. Freud did it through free association, through ink blots. You can do it through artwork. I mean, there's lots of ways to get to the unconscious. And the, and the unconscious is amazingly helpful, but not necessarily always completely accurate. Mm. Think about it for a minute. When you were a child and you had XYZ experience, you were experiencing it through your, your lenses, your, yep. your, your temperament, your senses, and your, a sibling might have interpreted that completely different. Which one of you is right? I mean, my, 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 my son will come to me and say, dad, you remember X, Y, Z when I was a kid, he, my son's 38. And I go, I don't fucking ever remember that happening. <laughs> and it's not that I'm in denial or want to oh, deny yeah. his reality, but yeah. he'll, he'll bring up stuff. And I go, I don't even have that in a memory bank anywhere, but in his memory bank is completely real. So part of the problem with, with digging around in this stuff it's real to us because that's how we experienced it and interpreted it. And that's what we have to deal with. Was it really how it happened? Maybe, maybe not. Okay. So I, I, again, I agree with you that this is beneficial information to say, hmm, for example, why do I keep repeating the same thing in relationship? Right. Why am I, I underperforming in work and career? Why, why can't I quit drinking? Well, you probably did inherit that from yeah. mom and dad that tends to be a genetically inherited trait you know why can't i pay attention well you might have inherited that too why do i have a ruminating brain odds are you inherited that did your life experiences add fuel to all of those probably, probably yeah did. yeah so i think it's important to understand but then we also have to have tools and, and speaking of tools um and you sort of talked about rumination out there uh through that out there i that's a problem i see in here a lot uh, it's probably my experience. Um, not as much anymore. I've done a lot of work on myself. I'm a belief, belief a big believer in, in therapy and, and in working on yourself and understanding your childhood, but you also need to develop tools, right? Yeah. And I'm so some of those, some of those tools that, cause we weren't given them, um, whoever raised us, whatever our situation or circumstance, um, nobody in my family unit was equipped with the tools that I needed, not my mother, not my father, nobody. And, and, and so, but now it is our responsibility as, as grown uh, folks to to learn some things. So um, what is the tool or what do you recommend to someone who who just rumination? Maybe but I want to focus more on just the ability to let go, because there's guys that are, that are in this group that have been here. There's seven thousand men in here. There's some men that have been here four or five years and they still struggle and they can't let go and they don't know what to do. Um, I know what I tell them, but sometimes, uh, you know, who the hell am I? you sir or somebody so well oh, that, that, that that makes me more right i i know um, i don't know about I, that but i think you just, <laughs> i think you your your words bear more weight because you wrote a book the whole life fucking people bought so so what what is what is it that you recommend to someone who just can't let go okay i, I actually teach a whole course on what i call the ruminating brain hmm. um my father had a ruminating brain i i i i do to some degree i do in context I think every every wife I've had has had a ruminating brain. Uh, so I've, I've lived with it. I think it's one reason I'm attracted to the women I am attracted to, because I learned to navigate my father's ruminating brain, his moods, his unpredictability, his, his detachment from reality. You know, he, he could, you know, his feelings became facts. And, and that's often true with people's ruminating brains. Uh, what we feel becomes real, and then we go looking for evidence to support it, and we just keep building the case. That's what ruminating is, is building a case. Right. There's comfort in that, right? There is. It gives you the illusion of control. Right. Um, and again, like I got a whole, you know, 16-lesson course on ruminating brain. The, it, 
the ruminating brain convinces you is gathering important information so that you don't make the same damn mistakes over and over again. That tells us that. That's not really what it's doing. Right. It can go back in time and, and rehash missed opportunities, bad experiences, bad choices, and, and say, well, if I just done that different, if I just done that different, if I hadn't done that way. And it gives you the illusion that if you could have just figured that out right, you'll never make that mistake again and everything will be okay. It doesn't actually. All it really does is make you feel like a total fucked up loser. Because if you rehash the same perceived mistake, missed opportunity, fuck up enough times, that's, that's like the totality of your world. Especially if you've got several of those things you regularly revisit. You spend enough time looking at where you fucked up, you're going to feel fucked up. Right. And, and it just becomes your belief system about yeah. you. Right. So it, it, it perpetuates the toxic shame. Another thing that we do by, you know, kind of re rehashing that past is we cre recreate what I call a revisionist history or one of my clients called it castles in the sky. Mm -hmm. We think if I just had not done that 25 years ago, I remember when I was teaching this course in person, one guy about my age in his 60s said, you know, I still ruminate about that missed sexual opportunity I had my sophomore year in college. And I know if I had just fucked her, my entire right. life would look like this. Right. He'd create a revisionist history that if that had been different, his entire life would be different. Right. Ignoring the fact that he has a ruminating brain and he would have actually, even if he fucked her, he'd still be ruminating about every missed opportunity and, and you know, past there'd be mistake. another one. Yeah, sure. There, there'd be some, well, there'd be many other things he would yeah. be ruminating. So, but we believe these revisionist histories to be true, that they could be true, which actually makes us feel worse about ourselves because now, Oh fuck. If I just done that, I would now have the most amazing life. No, right. you would still have the same stock ruminating life because you're a ruminator. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that's going into the past. Roommates also go into the future, still trying to gather sufficient information to not make the same mistakes. So what do you do when you ruminate about the future? You become a perfectionist. You think you have to figure everything out in advance to take action. So you don't take actions. You get stuck. You, um, you know, you, you, you're constantly looking for how this might go wrong, how it might go south, how the other shoe might fall. Um, you rehearse conversations in your mind. You rehearse everything so you get it right in the future. And do those rehearsals ever play out the way you thought they would in your head? Mine don't. That's my biggest rumination pattern is rehearsing things, rehearsing conversations. Ruminators also tend to compare themselves and measure themselves. Oh, that guy's so much further ahead than me now. Well, that guy's a douchebag and he has a pretty woman. How come I don't? You know, right. oh, by this age, I should have accomplished this. Or, right. you know, all of it is just rumination with the guys that is gathering important information. All this really doing is making you feel bad about yourself, usually keeping you socially isolated yes. and keeping you stuck. That's all rumination does. Now, in looking at it for a number of years and, and studying it, I also believe that for a lot of people, that rumination is part of their inherited temperament. They usually don't have to look too far in the family tree to see one or more family members that had depressive tendencies, addictive tendencies, control tendencies, rigid religion tendencies, uh, uh, inability to be in a relationship, uh, be faithful. You usually don't have to look far to find a, a good friend of mine was, was sharing with me. He's a recovering addict, and he's shared with me his suicidal ideation. His mother committed suicide when he was a teenager, and his dad's brother committed suicide. He's got this kind of rumination, suicidal ideation pattern coming from both sides of the family tree. Uh, any accident that, you know, he says, I can go curl up in my bed for days at a time and my ruminating brain just, he calls it the assassin. He mm -hmm. just beats the shit out of him. Mm -hmm. And he's a good looking guy. He's successful. He's talented. He has a great life. He has great kids. But his mind can convince him he's a total fucked up loser. That's just mind, right? That's yeah. just a pattern of mind. Now, trauma can do the same thing. PTSD can be a form of this trauma that we start, we become hypersensitive to certain things because it caused us great pain in the past. So we, we can ruminate that well. So if you inherit the tendency towards rumination 
and because your parents might have been ruminators and put you in situations that increase mm -hmm. the likelihood of you having trauma, you got a double dose of it. Yeah. Right? So, so what do you do? What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> Fix the it. way that what, what I do is I tell folks, I, I begin with, you may never get rid of this. So let's, let's stop trying to get rid of it. It may be a companion for the rest of your life. And because trying to get rid of it just puts us in a deeper state of rumination. How can I get rid of this? Mm. So what I do teach people is I give them a lot of mindfulness practices and a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy practices to slow the thinking, to redirect thinking, to be mm. the watcher and observer. The main, my, my, my mantra throughout the ruminating brain course is that we're going to practice being the, the the noticer the observer not the believer of our thoughts whether you have a ruminating brain or not our minds our thoughts lie to us all the freaking time yeah. all the time yeah. we just because we hear it all the time we think it must be true yeah. right that's that's why we're most of us are so susceptible to the echo chamber of social media. Oh, you hear something enough times, it has to be true, especially social media is set up with, with algorithms to keep giving you the same thing you've already looked at. Yeah. That's what our minds do. They, they keep rehearsing what feels familiar. I've heard that neurologists say we have about a thousand thought impulses every second. That's a yeah. lot of thought impulses, but yeah. we don't notice them. But the thing is, we we can actually, with practice and awareness and consciousness, start attuning ourselves to those thousand impulses. Now, to actually take in a thousand a second would make us schizophrenic. So it's not a good plan. But we can start noticing what are the prominent ones that, have, that we've learned to attune ourselves to yeah. because they've been there the longest. Like, as a, I'm so bad, nice guy. You probably started the internal negative thought talk at a really early age. So you've mm. been hearing it for a long time. And you know anything you hear for a long time, we assume must be true, yeah. right? So your mind just keeps believing it's true. So what I, I try to help people do with ruminating brain, uh, this is an analogy one of, one of my course members gave me one, one time that I really love. He said, if I, you know, I'm inside the washing machine being spun by the washing machine. He said, if I can step outside the washing machine, I can still watch it spinning. I just don't have to be spun by it. But when you're inside it being spun, you don't realize that there's a way out. You don't realize that the spinning is just part of them. It's just a part of what your brain's doing, right? Your brain is just doing that thing. Right. But when you can step out and be the noticer, the observer, the witness, the non-believer of it, especially... The, the assignment that I give every person that takes my course, and I tell them, this course is powerful. It can, it, it can, it can change your life in amazing ways. I, I think it's as much of a breakthrough awareness as reading No More Mr. Nice Guy is for a lot of guys. Mm -hmm. That people go, fuck, that's me. I've got a ruminating brain. I'm not fucked up. My brain just keeps telling me that I am, right? right. That's, a, that's actually a big breakthrough. Yeah. So how do we learn to be the witness of it? I tell people, you have to get a notebook and you have to start writing down what are your rumination patterns. Because if you don't write them down, you've been, you've been in, caught up in them for so long, they just, they're just normal thoughts, yeah. right? But what if I, wrote, I write down, I've got ruminate and give them, give them a name. My rumination pattern, rehearsing conversations. Now, whenever I notice my health, self-rehearsing a conversation, usually because I'm stressed or anxious about something or want, you know, I want things to turn out a certain way. I notice it because I know that's a rumination pattern I have. You know, if you, and again, you got to write these down. And, and, and most of us will have a dozen or more rumination patterns. And the longer you keep the notebook, the more you notice the subtleties yes. of each of the ruminating patterns. So now, because I know I have a ruminating pattern of rehearsing conversations, as soon as my mind starts doing it, I notice it. And I can say, wait, stop. And then I ask myself a couple of questions. Am I going to have this conversation? If the answer is no, I go, fucking stop the conversation. Stop rehearsing it. We don't need to rehearse a conversation we're not going to have. The brain is just has some illusion of control or some release by rehearsing a conversation I'm never going to have. Okay. But it's an illusion. If we're not going to have the conversation. It's, it's just mental masturbation. Yep. Okay. If I say, yes, I am going to have the conversation. Okay. When? 
I make myself commit to when I got, and you know, I, I, I usually, if it's all, at all possible, make myself do it within 24 hours. Hmm. I will have the conversation when I see the person tomorrow. I'm going to get on the phone and have the conversation right now. I'm going to send them a message and say, can we talk? Uh, here's what I'm going to do to have the conversation, right? So I, I, I could put a plan of action in there if I'm going to have it. Then I ask myself the question. When I have the conversation, am I going to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth? And I'll go, yeah, that's the only way to have a beneficial conversation. Then I'll, then I'll say, then stop fucking rehearsing the conversation because the truth doesn't need rehearsal. Just talk to the person and tell them the truth, whatever my truth is. That's my pattern for how I start. And, and the good news is we can start treating our ruminations as those kind of big sticks, the wake up calls, like, like the addicts. I'm a great forward. Okay, I know what my ruminations are now. When I start ruminating, I can ask myself those questions. I can go kind of, kind of through a cognitive behavioral thing. I can do something I call an obsess appointment, which is more kind of a mindfulness meditative state, where I'll just set my timer for eight minutes and I'll go consciously obsess about everything I've been unconsciously obsessing about. Timer goes off after eight minutes. I'm done thinking about it. I cannot think about that thing until my next obsess appointment. Now, I can either plan one in 15 minutes or later today or tomorrow, but then I can start telling myself, no, I will only obsess about this inside a planned obsess appointment. And so you, you start taking some leadership and some discipline of your mind. Yeah. And so, and these are just, just a couple of the techniques, uh, writing yeah. them down, observing them, having a conversation with yourself, doing an, an obsess appointment, um, having a conversation with a friend. I mean, there's uh, just get it out, right? breathe calm yourself yeah. you know and ask yourself why in this moment am i obsessed about this thing well maybe you know in, in alcoholics anonymous they talk about halt hungry angry lonely tired most of the time we slip into our worst mental habits emotional habits and behavioral habits when we're not doing well when we're hungry angry lonely tired you know whatever if we can use these things to check in what am i feeling right now well, actually, I'm kind of anxious, or actually, I've been pissed off for a while, or actually, I didn't need anything this morning. We then can start taking the actions that help us be at our best. So we can we can use these rumination patterns as that big stick, the wake up, if we've learned to pay attention to what they are and not just get caught up in believing them as soon as they start spinning. And I, I'm convinced if you catch a rumination before its third loop around your head, you can inter you can intervene in it. Once it gets to the third loop, it's now just it's just background thought that just runs day and night. So I think it's safe to say you you can't solve shit without some action, right? Because I think guys just expect <laughs> action's a good thing, right? I think guys just expect well, if if you could just tell me, you know, the magic formula to stop overthinking or to stop ruminating or stop obsessing about her, well, you got to put in some fucking work. And A, like you said, you, you got to determine how or, or get good at catching those thoughts, being conscious of them, being mindful. When I say mindful, I always imagine like some monk on a fucking mountain, like, oh, but that's not fucking mindful. Right. And yeah. but, but, but I think this is a very foreign concept to a lot of guys. They don't they don't observe their thoughts. They're not mindful. I'm not I'm not knocking them. They weren't taught. We weren't yeah, taught. None of us were taught. You know what? I taught a lesson on love on, on I, I, I have a new a membership program. Um, and on, on this last Thursday on, on our, our brotherhood call, the full call, I taught, you know, this 20 minute lesson on love and, and, you know, with three key points to it, we, we, we look for love in all the wrong places. We look for love outside of us. We're, we are love. Love is, is within us. Uh, Self-care, loving ourselves is, is the ultimate expression. So anyway, I gave this lesson and it was, it was to me, it was a very powerful, poignant lesson. And I, and I got some emails this morning, some messages, actually, from, um, from a, a guy I know. He's, he's, he lives in Ireland. He's an uh, um, orthodontist. And he, he's, you know, he's, 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 we've had some conversations, and he's really supportive of the work I do. And he said, Robert, that message about love was so profound. And he said, why do, not, why do school systems mm. not teach children how to love themselves? and how to love and be love and, and, and love. So yeah, the, these basic life skills, what do you do with the ruminating brain? Of course that doesn't get taught in, in school. You know, how do you have healthy relationships? And no, it doesn't get taught in school. About, about all that's taught in school now is 
gender does not exist. There's as many genders as there are people on the planet. So, you know, there. Now all of a sudden kids are more confused. I don't know what I am. Am I a boy? Am I a girl? I'm a, you know, I'll have to guess. So, you know, whatever is being taught in schools doesn't seem to be all that helpful right now. So yes, learning appropriate action based on the, the situation, of course, is powerful because most of us with ruminating brains, I found that ruminating brain tends to go hand in hand with ADD, ADHD, and addictions. So most people with ruminating brains, guess what they do? They medicate a lot. They tend to drink to, to, to calm the voices. They smoke a lot of pot so they can go to sleep at night and calm the voice down. That's the actions we're taking rather than yeah. saying, okay, your, your brain may always have these thought impulses. How do you tune to different ones or not believe the ones that are there? Yeah. And it does take some practice. It does sure. take some action. Just, Fuck yeah. just telling someone, quit thinking about her. Right. <laughs> quit thinking about the bitch. Right, you know, right. Doesn't work. But for yeah. example, if I was working with somebody, depend on, on you know the person's obsessive connection with, say, a woman from their past. Um you know, if, if they're obsessed about some woman and can't get over her, yeah, like you said, some therapy could be really helpful because usually the women that we get obsessed with are often because we got into some kind of what, what I call trauma bonded or drama bonded relationship that was a recreation of a, of a basic issue from our earliest experience in life of, of thinking, oh, I'll never get another one like this. She's so great. Right. She's so amazing. But, you know, she she has no ability to to manage her emotions. She can't be available. She's unfaithful. But, oh, man, she sure is hot. And I sure have a great time when we fuck. Right. You know, we get caught up in that. Well, why? Yeah. Not because she's hot and because she's a great fuck when she does get around to fucking you. It's, it's because somehow it fills some familiar or empty place from, from your childhood life experience. Right. So, yeah, doing some therapy can, can be helpful. One of the things that, that I do with guys that put their ex up on a pedestal that she was so fucking amazing, I said, write down all of her bad traits. Write down all of the terrible things she did in a relationship. Well, and usually that list is actually really long. Fuck yeah, it but, is. But, but some men... <laughs> are so good at just tuning all that out because, yeah. but, but she was fucking hot and she was fucking good right. in bed, right. you know, um, you know, crazy in the head, crazy in the bed, right. you know, and, and, but, and we got addicted to that. And now every other woman seems boring and yeah. tame and yeah. dull and uninteresting because yeah. they don't activate that drama bonded, trauma bonded relationship. Yeah. So one of the things we can do to start breaking trauma bonded, drama bonded relationships is, is to focus actually on all their terrible traits. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I don't give that assignment to everybody. Yeah. There's some guys that are obsessed about their exes. She was such a fucking bitch. She destroyed yes. my life. She was so terrible. She took me to the cleaner. She lied in court. She yes. took my kids. She poisoned them. I don't have a relationship anymore. I'm broke now. You know, And they're caught up oh. in what a terrible fucking bitch she was. Yes, Guess sir. what I do with those guys? I don't have them make a list of all the bad traits. <laughs> That's probably smart. Yeah. What I do is I have them start a daily gratitude practice of thankfulness for every gift that woman and that relationship gave to him. Oh, that's powerful shit there. I, I, I got to tell I, you, I, I, I've done that. I appreciate that so much because I think, and I, I want to cover one more topic, then I'm going to get some questions, but I think a lot of I think the guy that is sad and, and depressed and lonely, he can be helped and he can be fixed. And, and so can the other one. But I think they're more willing because they're they're sort of desperate. That angry, pissed off dude, yeah, he is harder to reach. He is damn near impossible to reach because it he has no... It feels good to be pissed off. There's right. a lot of emotional reinforcement. It's comfort. It's it's protection. There's uh, Anger is a fucking cage. I don't care what anybody says. It can be a good fuel and you can use it as such. But most men, it becomes a fucking cage where they you can't get them out of it. They, they're not going to want to get out of it. And there's going to be no change in their life. And all they're going to focus is on is, is the negative and the, and the, and the, the, the comfort in being able to point a finger and say it's not my fault it's that fucking bitch and it's hypergamy and it, and by the way that's bullshit all of that 
all that. I oh, I don't get me going on hypergamy. I I think well, it's... and that's why I had Sean on. That's why it, <laughs> Sean and I had that conversation. I think it's horseshit. I think that whole rational male can go fuck Sha- itself. Sha- quite, Sha- quite Sean, Sean and I have had that conversation. I met Sean at a red pill conference. You and I were both speakers there. Yeah. Uh, um, Rolo Tomasi was on the same program with us. Mm. That's where I met Sean, and it, like mm. I said, we 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 were like we fell in love instantly. Oh, we, he's really, a great guy. I think he's, he's been guy. he's been excommunicated uh, from from the. I, I'm not a red pill I, guy. I, I, I think I, red pill. I, I think it's I, horseshit. I'm, I'm 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 not either. I uh, uh, this, without going down that rabbit hole. Yeah, 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 that's a rabbit hole it, for sure. It does. It does. There's a lot of stuff I don't disagree with. Sure, there's what, some, there's some what, value what, in some of it. Sure. What I don't agree with is the us against them. Well, yeah. I, I I don't like that the, the women are out to get us, so we yeah. gotta we gotta fuck them before they can fuck us. <laughs> yeah. I I don't and I don't like the hierarchical system they create for men. Yeah. Oh, okay. We got red pill. You know, we're red pill. The blue pills, average right, frustrated right. chumps. Purple and black. I, and I, I, I just don't like that classifying men. And and most, yeah. you know, what? I've not actually met all that many true red pill guys. I've met a lot of guys who sit around and type on, on online forums yeah. about, you know, in, while sitting in their mother's basement on Friday yeah. night, you know, yeah. about, you know, all the, all the red pill yeah. philosophy. But yeah, without, without going after that. Yeah, I got you. Staying that's, that's angry. Staying, I'm with you. Cause like, Again, well, hey, we, we took a punch at red pill, you know, incels, MGTOW, men going their own yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. Most of that is fueled by anger yes. and resentment. And I'm a victim. I've been done too. Yes. So let me throw this out. Feeling victimized. Now we can be a victim. We can be victimized without being a victim. Amen. We we can have shit happen to us without that take without we us taking that on and defining our life. Yes. So here's a piece. This could be a whole nother, a whole nother podcast. Being staying in a victim state is a feminine place to be. It's not a masculine state. Masculine does. Feminine is done too. Now, I'm not talking about men and women. I'm talking yeah. about yeah. energetic. I got you. Yin, yin, yin and yang. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Sure. So the masculine in us goes and gets shits done. It takes action. The feminine in us feels done too. Now the feminine in us can also be done too in ways that feel blissful. Sure. Right. Oh man, that felt good. You know, right. get, getting getting a good blow job is you're you're in your feminine. You're receiving. You're being done too. You I, can be I enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, and and believe it or not, most men I work with have a hard time receiving even that. You know, is is we have to learn. I had to learn how to receive. Right. So, but feeling victimized, especially hanging on to that victim status, mm. is feminine in nature. Now, all these you know guys feeling victimized by women are going out. Go, I'm going to be the alpha. I'm gonna right. be- no, actually, you're still in the one down beta position because you're in the feminine position of feeling victimized. Feeling victimized, as you said, it just it it helps us soothe. You know, so the truth is, shit happens in life. Yeah, I mean, I, there- and, and it's not fair. You you are a victim if you've been lied to, if you've been cheated on, if you've been left. In some ways, you have you you have been victimized. Like you said, I love that phrase. You, you can be victimized, and not be a victim. Not be a victim. Yeah, that's all. That's amazing. I've never heard it that way, but that's I, I say something very similar. Not as quite quite as eloquent. It's like you can you are a victim if you've been lied to, cheated on, left. You're a victim. exactly. But if you stay a victim, you're you're not you're not gonna. You're that's not gonna on you. Move forward. You're victimizing yeah. yourself. Hundred percent. Agree. Yeah. So 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 for those so those guys that that are are focused on and, and there's something that popped in my head too it's like uh the, the power of pussy like a lot of guys <laughs> i mean i love Putting it i mean pussy on the pedestal <laughs> oh i mean I, I who doesn't love it i i mean i, I guess if, if you have a different persuasion i whatever do, do your own thing but but why do men or, or no i don't want to i don't ask that i want to ask why or a lot of times what, what gets, what gets <laughs> you, you, you're trying to trying to decide how do i ask this in a way that you know doesn't get me in too big of trouble right oh uh, no i don't give a shit about that i mean i'm, I'm not <laughs> I, i'm not that i'm not famous enough to get in trouble yet um hopefully someday maybe i don't know yeah, hopefully um, you, you hope know so. you've arrived when you start getting attacked oh yeah oh that does happen but it not it's not quite to the level i'm sure some of the some of you guys and sean and, and different folks get but um why is it that so so the the general um advice is wait one year before dating uh, and there are men in here and there are questions i'm going to get to here in a few minutes i don't want to keep you forever but this has been awesome and I, i'm really enjoying it but why what what is what is your and i know everyone's different but i think there's nothing wrong with waiting a year but i don't even know if a year sometimes is 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 uh is adequate uh if it was a really traumatic thing and you've learned nothing during that year then you, you might as well you're spinning your fucking wheels and you're you're starting from scratch but 
I guess one is how long or wh- or when, maybe it's better to ask when instead of how long, because that's arbitrary, I, I think a little bit. When When is it okay for men to start dipping their toe back into that pool? And, and why is it that that is like almost that, because I did it too. I, three weeks after she left, I was putting my dick in somebody else. But why is it that as soon as we get left, we are looking for another woman to soothe our wounds and, 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 and how do we, how do we stop that? I guess, or how do we focus on something else? Yeah. You know, you know I have what I'm an saying? Answer. Uh, I have an answer. Well, it's, it, 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 it's not amount of time, but I do have an answer. All right. Um, we're, we're going to dive in a little bit more to the masculine and feminine. Right. Um, the feminine in all people is the part that craves connection and the flow of love. We all have a feminine side, man, whether we're men or women. We all have a feminine side that, that craves connection, flow of love. It's part of being human. Yep. We all have a masculine side that doesn't give a fuck about connection and flow of love. The, the masculine is just about masterfully doing whatever needs to be done. Yep. Right? Just masterfully do that and go rest in consciousness. So what happens is kind of going back to my lesson on love. I told you I taught the other day. Our culture has taught us to look for love in all the wrong places. And two of the worst places to look for love. And we need love, right? There's a part of us that needs love. But the feminine in us is, I say, it's an empty bucket with a hole in the bottom that has to be filled externally. So the feminine is always looking for love, looking to be filled, but it runs out the bottom. That's that's why there's feminine demand. That's why the feminine is never enough for the feminine. Because even if it's flowing in right now, it could quit at any time and I have no control over it. That's the vulnerability of the feminine part of ourselves. And of course, in women. Okay. That's why so many women actually become so masculine and so controlling because it feels really vulnerable to be in that dependent feminine place that you have to be filled externally. Okay. So one of the things we're taught by getting love is you go find it outside of you. Mm. Okay. But how's that working so far? You know, okay, I'm going to find this person to love me. I'm going to find love out here. I'm going to find love out here. Searching for love outside yourself never does accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. We are love. We are the source of love. Now we all, I believe our basic three human needs are to, to love to 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 be loved and to feel lovable hmm. and, the, and then maybe the, all the three of those overlap if you sure. talk to most men and if men just kind of get real you say would you rather love somebody or be loved most men said i'd rather love I and that's one that reason why i think hurt. most wives many men are, are so hurt and wounded i loved her i gave her my love i didn't get get any back I didn't get it back in the way that I should have. And it's, and it's probably true. because the, 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 And here's the other mistake. The feminine is not the source of love. The feminine is the consumer of love. So the other mistake we men make is going to feminine creatures seeking to get our own feminine bucket filled. They're already a bigger empty bucket with a bigger hole in the bottom than us, and they're looking to be filled. So when we go to feminine creatures with this empty neediness, which we all have, and say, love me, fill me, be, you know, be, they're going, that, that's fucking is repulsive to me. That turns me off. They push it away. I mean, um, Mark Manson's book, Models, basically talked about, you know, it's a dating book, and it said that you know, neediness is the most repulsive thing to women. Mm-hmm. Because we're in an empty bucket place saying, come fill my empty bucket, which means they got to go into their masculine. I've been saying for some time now that the masculine in all people is the source of love, not the feminine. The feminine is the consumer, the seeker of love. If you go back, if you have, uh, I highly recommend your, your, your guys read The Road Less Traveled by M. Scott Peck. I haven't read it in a few years, but I probably read it multiple times years ago. It's the all-time best-selling self-help book, The Road Less Traveled. His definition of love is basically this, the intention and action to act in one's own or another's best interest. You can Google Scott Peck's definition of love. It's brilliant. But it involves intention and action. Those are masculine traits. Those are not feminine traits. The masculine does. It has intention and takes action. The feminine is done too by the masculine. Okay, So we've been lied to 
for centuries through music, through culture, through movies, through glorifying mothers. Oh, everything about the feminine is love. But if you even think about a mother, most of what a mother does with her child or infant or child is masculine because it's doing. You got to feed them. You got to clean them. You got to bathe. You got to protect them. You got to put them to bed. You got to make sure they get their homework done. You got to make sure that they go to the doctor. You know, it's all masculine. The only real feminine act between a mother and a child is maybe the just holding the, the baby to her breast and looking into his eyes and there's a flow of love. Everything else is masculine. That's why so many mothers are so disappointed and angry and bitter about being mothers. They got lied to. I was going to get loved by this child. No, fuck, I have to love it all the time, right? So if we go looking to feminine creatures for our source of love to fill our bucket, we're going to keep getting hurt and wounded and be resentful and angry over and over and over again. It's not what they do, right? Now, so what are our options? I think they're twofold. One is our masculine can husband and nurture our own feminine side. We can be consciously taking the time to nurture ourselves. Now that can take a lot of different forms, getting enough sleep, going to the dentist, connecting with people. Um, this morning, my, my wife and, and my stepkids went to Guadalajara this weekend. I, I live in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. So she went to visit family. I'm here by myself. So this morning I get up, I've got my cup of coffee, my pit bull Nala's by my side, just, you know, she's just loving being here with Papa. And I'm, I'm just, you know, enjoying my morning, enjoying the moment, just being nurturing myself. I'll take a nap sometime today. I'll nurture myself. I'll eat, I'll eat well today. I'll nurture myself. I'll get in and then exercise today. That's more of a masculine nurturing, but I'll nurture myself. I'll talk to some friends today. I already have talked to some friends today. I'll nurture myself. I'll feel nurtured from having this conversation with you. I will consciously be husbanding my own feminine. I'll be filling my own empty bucket uh, consistently enough because it's flowing out the bottom, right? I will, my masculine will nurture my family. That's, 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 you know, any, any gratitude practice you do, any just resting in, in, in nothingness, walking in the park, uh, sitting in nature, listening to good music, having really enjoying a nice glass of wine, good conversation, good meal. All of that is nurturing. Okay. I'll brush and floss my teeth a couple of times today. That's nurturing to me. It says, it says I'm valuable. I'm lovable. That's number one. Our own masculine can nurture our own feminine. Number two, spend time with men. Spend time with people that have a strong masculine side. I found when I stay connected with men, I feel much more loved and much more filled. I, if I go spend a bunch of time with a group of women, I'm not going to walk away from that feeling loved and nurtured and filled. I'm going to walk away wanting to put, you know, ice picks in my ears, you know. Oh, man. <laughs> Fuck, drive me crazy, you know. But if I go spend time with men, and that's why I'm in a men's program. Mm -hmm. I, I have several of my own men connection groups. I'm on signal all day long connected with men. I run men's programs. I do interviews with men. My life is teeming with men. Okay. And I always feel loved when I'm with men. I go get around women. I'm trying to figure out how to get them to love me and value me, or I'm loving them. Right. Now, one mistake nice guys often make is we often go give all of our love to some female creature, some empty bucket outside of us. Our own inner bitch goes, what the fuck, asshole? How come you give her so much and you totally neglect me? Right. You think a little resentment builds up inside there that our own inner feminine is pissed off because we're just giving all these goodies, all of our attention, all of our money, the BMW, you know, this, right. that, yeah, we're giving it all to that other, you know, empty bucket and our own empty buckets going, what? I don't exist. You know, I'm, 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 I'm breadcrumbs. I don't matter. You know? Right. Right. So number one, quit looking for love outside of you Two, quit looking for love from feminine oriented creatures right number three husband your own feminine your own masculine husband in your own feminine side number four spend as much time as possible with with people men or women who are in their masculine and therefore in a, in a place to give love my, my, my wife very you know like like a, most women i'm attracted to is a, has a very strong masculine side most women do 
Now, masculine, remember, love is, is expressed through action. I'll be sitting here like doing an interview, you know, like this or online working. And my wife will kind of sneak in my office here and put a glass of coconut water on my desk and then sneak back out again. Mm. That's fucking love. Now it's coming from a, a, a feminine person, but it's a, it's an act. It's a masculine act. It's a doing act. And so my, my, my wife and, and many women out there are very loving but they show it in masculine ways, not the ways that we men tend to think is going to come. You don't feel loved just because you loved a person. You don't feel loved just because you want their approval and their validation or even their sex. Um, that isn't what makes you go away feeling loved. You go away feeling loved when they treated you, acted in a way that, that you walked away and said, that felt loving. They didn't have to say they loved me. I knew they loved me through their action and uh we could spend a whole fucking podcast talking about i, I knew that. we could <laughs> I, I knew i was hoping up something that believe me I, I i i've been working on this shit for a long enough time i i i, I know what it opens up uh well it, it's it's fascinating i think it, it it does beg a question you know if i'm a bitter i don't know if how far i want to go down this road but if i'm a bitter man what i might hear is what the fuck do i need women for well if you're a bitter man you're in your what i call your lower feminine you're dwelling in that I've been done too, right? I'm a victim. And then a guy asked me a question on, on, on one of my membership calls the other day. I, we have time for Q&A. And, and we get down where I go, okay, two-minute drill. I'm going to take two, two-minute, um, you know, timer's on. Yeah. You have to ask, and I got to answer in two minutes, okay? Nice. And th this one guy, and I, and I love this guy. He asked me the best questions. He's, he's, he's on the spectrum. And so his questions are like, you know, the, there's just, and he said, Robert, if you could take your wisdom that you have now, put it in your teenage body, what would you do? How would you be different? I go, oh, I question. fucking love that question. Good and question. I said, and I thought, I got to answer it with the first thought that came up. I can't, I can't massage it. And then, sure. and, and the first thought that came up was I'd spend less time with women. I'd spend less time pursuing women, trying to get women to like me, approve of me, trying to get them to have sex with me. Uh, I don't know if, you know, I like being married, so I might still get married, but I'd probably get married in different ways than I've gotten married. I I might get married and not live with a woman. Um, I, I, I would just spend less time with women. Now, that's not a, a MGTOW, you know, oh, I, I don't need women. They're terrible. Right. Um, you know, people are amazing. You know, the gender doesn't matter. People, people are amazing. And people can be terrible. Sure. You know what? I think I'm just going to choose to be with the amazing people and not the terrible people and not worry about their gender. Okay. Mm. So if we get focused on all women are terrible, you know, for me, it's actually a nice relief. And I think for a lot of men to just go, listen, let's just assume she's an empty bucket with a hole in the bottom and she's just trying to get filled. That's all. That's not a terrible thing. We have an empty bucket with a hole in the bottom is trying to be filled. Now, a lot of people take that as being kind of misogynistic of saying, well, the famine is an empty bucket. Right, right. I'm not saying it. I mean, does that sound mean? It just sounds like, okay, there's part of us that needs to be filled, right? That's just, you know, anybody that does, you know, inner child work or, you know, you know, any of this kind of work, it's about taking care of, of that needy part of you, right? So yeah. we have a needy part. So this is not about, I would never have anything to do with women. Right. Would I spend less time pursuing from women what they can't give me? Right. What yeah. you what you what you what you thought they could give you, what you expected they could give you. What right? I was trained and you know brainwashed, and, and we all have. We've all been brainwashed. Sure. To believe it. Women even believe this stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know, look, look at how many how many women now are kind of you know going their own way and right. just you know you know at an early age not even hanging with men. Just you know, hey, I'm just going to go have relationships with women. Yeah. They also believe that same myth, but feminine or um, lesbian relationships. I'm going to say something that this might get me in trouble, <laughs> have a higher incident of domestic violence per capita than straight relationships or gay relationships. Gay actually have the least incident mm. of domestic violence. So now you got two women together, both going, you should fill me, you should fill me, I'm an empty bucket. And now they're pissed off. Both of them are pissed off because you're not filling me. You're not filling me. Hmm. And, and so again, I'm, I'm making a pretty big generalization and yeah. mixing gender with you know sure, sexual sure. dynamics. But the, the point is, this is not an indictment of women. It's just okay. All of us have a part of us that is seeking love and connection. Yeah. All of us have a part of us 
that 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 gets the most joy out of giving love mm. let's be realistic about what those parts are and where we're most likely to get them well it's i mean it's there's so much to this uh it, it, you know on this topic and i think the good thing is that you know we're looking at it we're questioning we're we're trying to figure out some of these answers um I, I wish I had all of them and I don't, I don't think anyone does, but um, <laughs> that, that's it, our ruminating brain going. If I just had all the answers, everything would work. <laughs> but, hey, uh, well, I, I, I got shitloads of answers, but that doesn't mean I apply them all to my life or that uh, the life even goes the way I think it should. Uh, brother, I can I be preaching to the choir here. Um, so I want to, I want to get to some questions that some guys asked. Um, we kind of covered some of them, so I might just skip it. This one he's asking, is it generally accepted that men should wait a year? after separation well, well, let, let, let me just throw that piece out because sure. you know i actually made a lot of rules for myself when i started dating but the rules were just to keep me more conscious to, because you know i'll even go back to you know sean's new book gatekeeper and he says what i've been saying for years is that most of our relationship dynamics it, it occur at such an unconscious level yeah. that we don't know that we're out there fusing with a woman trying to lock it down making sure she loves us and she's available to us because we're trying to deal with something that she can't actually do for us and then in that needy place we actually probably end up driving her away right yeah. we do all of that really unconscious so i as i became aware of my unconscious patterns i made rules up to go with them like i stayed off the phone with women early on because I found that talking with women on the phone amps up a relationship and basically gives the woman what she wants. Well, the guy, you know, just getting, I mean, what, what do we get as guys by talking on the phone to a woman? You know, e e even if we have some phone sex, it's still just fucking phone sex. You right. know, she's actually not really doing anything to us. Right? right. Right. So I had to make rules to help guide me. Now, when I got out of my second marriage, I didn't want to date. I, I really done a lot of heavy lifting. I actually started going to a 12-step group. And I said, I'm going to be pissed off for as long as it takes to be pissed off. I said, if it takes two years being pissed off, I'm going to be pissed off for two years. I, I let myself be pissed off. That's okay. But I also knew there was an end point to it. Mm. And, and well, I did, yeah, I did, you know, when I think about dating, I go, I don't even fucking want to listen to a woman talk. <laughs> it just seems burdening to me. So I didn't date for several months, not quite a year, but for several, I focused on my book had just come out. I focused on me building yeah. my business, doing things. I, I, I focused on building more of a social life because I didn't have any while I was mm. married. So I, I focused on taking good care of me. So I would say rather than setting a time, make it a focus that you go out and take care of you, work on your male relationships. I, in marriage therapy, I always told couples, the best thing you can do for your marriage is have good same sex friends. So most men, when they get out of relationship, they've lost all their buddies, mm -hmm. go work at building male relationships, get into a men's group, get into some kind of men's program, go, you know, rekindle your old friendships that you let go, um, go connect with men. Because what I found is when we're getting our significant number of needs met with men, the appeal of women tends to go down. And even the neediness for sex tends to go down. I found men who are the most needy for sex are usually the men who are not getting the rest of their needs met in a very predictable, consistent way. So focus on your basic core needs. Connect with men. And I think you'll find it, a lot of the neediness you have towards women wanting to fuse quickly, getting dependent on them, mm -hmm. you know, you know, getting needy around sex with them. It actually diminishes the more you're getting your needs in general. So as odd as it sounds, the more regularly you floss your teeth, the less you're going to feel needy for sex. Mm. Test it. No, I, I don't disagree. I think, I mean, you, you got to focus on yourself. I mean, that's, I think usually this question is under the guise of, hey, it's only been two months, but I'm pretty sure I'm ready. No, dude, you're fucking yeah. not ready. Stop. Well, I tell you, here's where men have. Most men start this as soon as they feel like they might be done with the relationship. They go on the online apps and start looking what's out there. Oh, yeah. And again, that's because we are dependent on yes. the feminine for love and connection and validation, which is our feminine. So what instead of going on the online apps and start looking at what's out there, and of course, you know, 
are, are they young? Are they cute? Are they attractive? Are they sexy? That's the only reason to look for a woman on an online app is finding the women that we don't think we could get in real life. And, and, and we start testing that. And I can't tell you how many marriages have blown up because the woman caught the guy on dating apps while they're still fucking married and living together because he was testing for, should I leave her? I need right. to know for sure there's something right. else I could jump to that looks better than yeah. what I've had for the last five years, 10 years, 15 years. External so, validation. Yeah. So yeah. how long should you take? Um, maybe when you get over needing women for a sense of validation and okayness. And when you've taken back the keys that they control your sexuality. Fucking A. Amen. All right. So this one, <laughs> this one comes from, uh, I'm not going to say his, his name, but he's, he's someone that I, you know, I deal with and, and inter have interacted with on a regular basis. This That's is, I'll, I'll call him RS. Uh, so I'll read the whole thing. As a guy that's a year and four months separated, I know my marriage ending is the best thing that happened to me and ultimately my son. However, I still have days where I question my self-worth, not only as a man, but as a father. I guess my question would be, how could someone in my position go to get over that mental block when you feel such like such a failure? Okay. I Again, wish there was an easy answer to that. Probably we'll go back to your default answer, get some therapy. Yeah. One of the... To me, you know, and, not, and no more Mr. Nice Guy, I stress early on and often, and I've been stressing it for 25 years now. To break these patterns, you need safe people. You need to go and be with safe people and reveal your toxic shame. To, to let the shame come up, let it be yes. out, be heard, yes. and get more accurate views of who you really are. Yeah. So I, as, get, as I, when, I want to plug my poetic statement, shame does not survive sunlight. The more you talk about yeah. shit, the less it kills it. And, and with, with, with safe people yes. and with the intention of letting it go, not yes. wallowing in it, wallowing in it, because having a, a you know, it, 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 again, it, it, there can be emotional payoffs for staying in shame, victim place. But I'll give you just a quick example. Sure. A guy came to, to one of my workshops. It's been a few years ago. And, and I'd actually been working with him individually uh, over the Internet at that time. And um, he was in a relationship with a woman who just treated him like shit. Why? Because he had a lot of toxic shame. He thought, mm. yeah, why, why, why should I expect anything different? Yeah. He came to the workshop. African-American, tall, good looking. This guy could get any woman he wanted. But during the workshop, but, but he always also felt intimidating and didn't want to scare people because he was a big, tall African-American. Yeah. Um, so during the workshop, he started talking about how terrible he was, you know, just his shame. I said, can you like give us an example of why you feel like you're such a terrible human being? And he started crying and he goes, when I was like teenagers, 15, I stole a car stereo out of the car. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the whole group of guys is sitting there looking at him. He's crying. We're going, finally, somebody says it. That's it. That's all right. you did. Right. And you think you're a terrible. Yeah. And then, then the whole group of guys starts sharing every stupid thing they did at 15. Uh -huh. And the guy felt held and loved and not yeah. alone and not a terrible. And that one moment of sharing what he had, now, it, of course, he had shame from other things, but that was kind of a defining proof of how bad he was releasing that piece of shame and the other guy saying, you're not terrible. I, l listen to what I did. That's terrible. Right, you know, right. to hear that yep. the guy got out of that relationship a few months later, started dating a therapist who thought he was fucking amazing and treated him like gold. And I mean, I haven't heard from him in a few years, but last I heard he was loving life, loving his relationship, loving because he went and found safe people and released the shame and got more accurate messages about himself. So if whatever your brain's ruminating about that, you're terrible, you're a fuck up, right? Go find safe people, release it, and then start doing that work around your ruminating brain where you keep revisiting the same perceived fuck ups over and over again. The more you do it, they say in, in, in neurology, neurons that fire together, wire together. The more you think something or do something, the more it, it feels normal and true. So the more you, again, the more you think about your past fuck ups and how terrible you are, the more believable it seems because you've got neural pathways that feel really familiar to you. 
Right. And again, it goes back to, you got to do some work. You got to put in the work. It's not, it's not easy. It's not easy to break that pattern or habit or, or, or to kill that shame, but it's possible. It is possible. It is. So uh, we'll call him Ed. Ed says, how do you separate feelings of not trying to hurt your ex, hurt your ex financially, but still protect yourself and getting back what's yours? Not, I, well, I guess what he, uh, Oh, every guy asks that question, you right. know, well, not, not Ed. The more nice a person is, the more you don't want to be an asshole, but you right. don't want you don't want to get taken to the cleaners. Okay, so here here's the deal. A couple of things. I think probably everybody listening already knows what I'm about to say. Number one, when women go through divorce, their math skills go to hell. <laughs> 50, 50 50 takes on really weird proportions, right? So I, I and so guys will tell me, well, you know, I I don't I don't want to go through a divorce because I'll lose half of everything I own. And I go, no, let me correct you. You're going to lose 70% or more of everything you own. But right now, if you're married to her, she has 100% of everything you own. And no judge is going to tell her to quit spending money or running up your debt. You get you file for separation, file for divorce. Now you, that's under control. A judge will say you can't spend his money anymore. Okay. So. And the courts do tend to give are, are very you know generous with women especially when there's children involved and and how they came up with a system every state does this that says the more money a man makes the more money his children need to live on yeah why well, that that's not logical you know if one man makes you know fifty thousand a year and the formula says his kids need this much why does a man who makes a hundred thousand a year why does the formula say his kids need that much well, that extra amount of money doesn't go to the kids. It goes to the mom, right? We all know that, but that's the way the courts work. So yes, it's going to cost us. And they say, why is divorce so expensive? Because it's worth it. It's worth it. You get control of your life back. Okay, now what I tell men is I tell men, be generous without selling the farm. Don't get, I mean, men, when they get caught up, I'm, I'm going to try to hide this from her. No, uh, don't okay. do that. Don't fucking hide anything. Yeah. Well, I'm going I'm to try to manage this. No, the, I found the more that men try to manage the financial damage, the more the financial damage amps up because the woman senses that, that he's trying to fuck her, screw her. Or, or if, if the guy just says, I'm willing to give this much, not more. Yeah. I'm willing to take care of it. I'm willing for you. I want you to be okay but I'm not giving more than this. Just that. No, like trying to, the more time and energy a man spends conniving of mm -hmm. how to try to control, the more it's going to cost him to get divorced. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. Be generous, be caring, but don't give away the farm. Now, statistics show in general, the first five years after a divorce, the woman does better than the man financially. After five years, the man rapidly speeds past the woman if if he doesn't go get involved with another woman <laughs> that, that that you know right. takes him to the clean or or if the ex isn't britney spears or kelly clarkson because you know i i think that the 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 formulas are fucked um but they're skewed towards a higher earner whoever that may be uh typically well, obviously it's the man. They are, and, and you know bless the courts britney the the judge actually took britney spears kids away from her and gave him to a rapper. You know? uh, <laughs> so they actually did give, you know, the kids to the yeah, most same person in the yeah, relationship. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. she's paying through the fucking nose. I'm sure of it, which I good, bad or indifferent. I don't, I don't know. I don't know who determines these formulas or who made the decision or what, but uh, state legislatures do. Yeah. And it, and it's, you know, but, but based on what, like try and find out I'm in Pennsylvania, try and find out that formula. I mean, you can go on, there's a calculator, but the nuts and bolts of it, and I'm, and I'm sure maybe it exists somewhere, like 22% of or what the fuck ever it is. But oh, they, they do. Every every state has it written up. And talk to any attorney, they can tell you what. Yeah, it is. but who who made that? I mean, okay, the state, but state based on legislatures, what? but based state, on what? The, what are they based on? Presidents of the court in in past cases. The court, if the courts keep leaning in one direction, that becomes law. Even if it's actually not codified in law, court presidents becomes law. Hmm. And so what? And so, what what was it? What was the percentage that someone just someone still had to make a decision and say, "Well, it's twenty two percent of your income or whatever it is." Like, I, I it's it's arb it, it seems it's not arbitrary, but it seems arbitrary. I mean, it becomes locked it, in. It is just accept that it's arbitrary. 
Yeah, well, to, it, to question it any it more sucks. than that, <laughs> just, I mean, just understand it's arbitrary. Yeah, it, I mean, it sucks. I, I don't, I don't like it, but it is what it is. I mean, in, unless someone tells me exactly how to fix it, I get, I just, I get sort of tired of hearing about it because I pay a lot in child support. But I, what the fuck, am I going to do about it? Like, t- tell me how to fix it, and then I'll make that my raison d'être. Until then, I'm going to try and save men's lives and make their lives better. But anyway, um, well, so I'll, this- give you, I'll, give, I'll give you one thought about that without going down that rabbit hole. When I went on my book tour for No More Mr. Nice Guy back in 2003, a lot I did I did a lot of interviews, TV, radio, newspaper, and a lot of times interviewers said, Robert, do you see a worldwide men's movement coming? I said, no, I really don't think so. I don't think there's one unifying factor that would bring men together, kind of like yeah. it did with feminism. I now have actually changed my mind. I think mm-hmm. men's seeking tribe and connection and initiation is driving men to seek connections with other men. Now, it might be through a pickup boot camp. It might be through martial arts. It, it might be through a 12-step program. It might be a divorce group in their church. Um, you know, it could be a lot of different, but men are seeking connection and community. What I would say is I said, if there is one thing that might unify men and, and women might actually pitch in to help with, it is bringing some sort of sanity to um, the child support, craziness that is out there at least in the u.s and state legislatures because for example i don't know if you're in a relationship with another woman now nope. but when you are and she sees the x amount of money that flows out of you to another woman that's not her now it's for your kids but she will be pissed off about that mm. she will hate seeing all that money going out of your pocket into another woman's pocket now that, that doesn't make her a bad person i mean it, it just is so at some point, I do think there does have to be a movement of men and the women that support them in saying we need to bring legal sanity back to the divorce process and uh, child support payments, paying alimony and support to a woman who chose not to work for a number of years and the guy could support them. And now the courts say she, the guy has to keep supporting the standard of living that she's grown accustomed to. Why is that law? Why? Because the guy was generous while he's married. Does he have to be, keep being generous to a woman who wants to go fuck, you know, her personal trainer rather than him? Right. Anyway, I won't go down that rabbit hole, but what I'm saying, instead of us just kind of marinating in our anger, how about if men, smart men, men get, get connect, pool money, pool resources, create a movement where we actually legally take on state legislatures and the court systems and the way that it's skewed towards women against men. The only thing that's going to change it is a, a movement of organized men. Now, think about it. Laws are written by state legislatures. State legislatures are elected. They can be unelected. And if men got behind a movement, especially a national movement, that started going after state legislatures and say, if you do not bring sanity, and we can create a model of what sanity looks like, right? What fair looks like, and bring that to state legislatures. Now, most state legislatures, whether Democrat, Republican, doesn't matter. They're spineless. They only care about getting reelected. Now, they'll sure. act like they're principled, but they're, they're spineless. Sure. Yeah. But if this became a force of nature that state legislatures and judges knew if they did not pay attention, they would pay a price. I, I, I think something could happen. Now, that's going to take men getting organized, not just sitting around being pissed off. Like you said, take action. It's got to be men taking action rather than just moaning and groaning on online forums about how they got taken to the cleaners. Right. Well, and that's my issue is what's the what's the solution? I hear an awful lot of bitching and complaining and whining. OK, what fi- fix it? Tell me. I have said this many fucking times. You tell me what the fix is and I'll get behind it. No one ever has an answer. Oh, we just need to make it fair. What the fuck does that mean? Tell me gave, exactly what I gave you an answer. No, you didn't. Uh, yeah, no, I did. you didn't. No, what? No, you no, don't I, like my answer. I gave no, you one. No, what's it? How much should I pay in child support? I have two kids. No one's ever going to be able to figure that out for you. Well, but the, the answer but, is, but that is that is the question. We that can't is the make question. it the same. In no, most you, places, in most places, child, uh, uh, child custody is 50 percent. So, so the fact that that we say some folks say, "Oh, it's skewed to women," I, I don't think that's true. In in West Virginia, at least one state that I'm aware of, it's fifty fifty by law. 
So I think we're, we're, we're sort of, we're playing this victim mode because it makes us feel comfortable. I don't think the, okay, court, I, hear you. I don't think that the courts screw, screw men in general. Does it happen? Of course it happens. But again, ask Britney Spears, how much she pays in child support, ask Kelly Clarkson, how much she pays in child support. We're per perpetuating this myth that men are getting fucked. It's, it's not helpful. It just isn't. And what is the answer? What is the answer? There isn't one. Uh, I should pay $500 a month child support. Okay, that, that's less than I'm paying, sure. But until we get a solution that is specific and no one can ever give it, then then I'll be I'll get behind it. Until then, all we're doing is whining and bitching and not focusing on what we can control, which is ourselves. Yeah. So anyway, that's my soapbox. I, I, I hear you. And, and I agree that moaning and groaning won't get it done. And I'm not going to go out and take on the system. I don't see it as my mission. Yeah, But I think I think if somebody is willing to take on the system... I'll get behind a movement that really is about is about fairness. Sure. Okay? I'm all about um, fairness. Because statistically, if you look at statistics, it the, the courts are skewed towards women in divorce in monetary matters. Yeah, you've given a couple outliers of, of wealthy women. It's um, it's it's skewed against the higher earner, and that's typically men for yeah. sure. But but the formulas are no matter it's custody and income, period. And, and, and the guy who is typically the guy who has more income and that guy gets fucked. I'm getting fucked. There's no question. But I don't think it's because of the size of my genitalia. It's the size of my bank account or my paycheck. And if I if I had less, if I made less than her, which, again, it is rare. And so if you if you look at those stats without the caveat of, well, typically men make more and for whatever various reasons, I don't, I'm not getting into that fucking debate either. <laughs> right. But that's the case is that men are making more. Thus, men are getting fucked. But it's not because they have a dick. It's because they have a bigger bank account, period. So let's move on to a couple of other questions. This is a guy who's relatively new. Again, I won't mention his name. He's he's kind of in the thick of it. Um, he says, and, and this one, I'll paraphrase. So it's more about, and this is one that's common, guys that she leaves, she cheated, she left, and she's got a new guy in, 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 the, in her life, and that new guy is around the children. How do you wrap your head around? How do you deal with that? And maybe they're teaching the kids things that you don't agree with, or or maybe you're filling a vacuum there and assuming things. But how do you deal with um, a, another man being around your children? You have no control over that. You deal with it the way you deal with anything else you don't have control over. We don't have control over gravity. Yeah, We don't have control over that we pay taxes. We don't have control over a lot of things. Um, you can obsess about these things. But I, 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 you know, I kind of go back to a 12 step model, you know, grant me the serenity to accept the things I can't change the, 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 you know, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference, the wisdom to know the difference is the key factor in there. Can you change the fact that your ex is bringing another man around the kids? Probably not. Quit trying to control it. Quit obsessing. Is that other man doing things that are harming to your kids? Well, that's take action, yeah. take action sure. on that lawyer yeah. up. So either let go of what you can't change or lawyer up and take and change what you can. Yeah. Staying in, you know, probably what that is. There, there's a there's a maxim in marriage therapy that says what the couple is fighting about is not really what they're fighting about. You know, they come in, they're fighting about money, fighting about the kids, fighting about his or her affair. They're fighting. They're always fighting about something underneath. I don't know this guy. I don't know the situation. What he's obsessing about is probably not the real issue. The real issue is he, he's probably still connected to his ex. He's not he's, let go of her. He's hurt. Yeah. And he's, it, found, yeah. he's, he's hurt. He's found something to focus his attention on. It's that guy. He's coming around. He's doing that. Blah, blah, blah. The truth is he's not over his ex. That's okay. He's, yeah. he's got to go do the work of getting over his ex because she is going to be around a lot of other men. Not this guy, some other guy. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. No, it's it's something. I mean, I, I had to deal with it a little bit. Um, she's uh, about a year after. My ex was with someone, and yeah, you you have to accept it as shitty as it is. It ain't fair. It ain't right. All these things, but I can't I can't change it. Unfortunately, you, you know what? Both of my, both of my ex wives, my first two ex wives, believe it or not, this is true, both remarried within two weeks of our divorces being fine. Oh, both shit. of them, yeah, remarried within two weeks. That means they got with somebody else really quickly after we split. And, and which, of course, the piece I had to deal with with that was I meant something to her. 
you know, I'm that easily replaceable. Right? I had to deal with that. That, but that was just my own oh, inner bullshit. Right? Sure, sure. But the good news for me was that they connected with another dude and got married so quickly. It took their attention off me. I had no ongoing battles with either of my ex-wives, which you know what? If, if, if you know, if, if a new guy in their life got all of their bullshit, yeah. great. I, I was <laughs> I was doing a little bit of a happy dance around that, that they were with someone else and they didn't keep paying attention to me. Uh, it probably did. I'm, 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 I'm sure it probably took a little bit to get to at least the first time. Did it, did it take you a little bit to get to that point where you're just like, Oh, thank gosh. Like this. Is- I, I, I left her. So, you know, no, oh, okay. it wasn't that terrible. Okay. Well, I, I, but I, yes, I had a young son with her. I, my mm. son was two when we split. Okay. So was I upset? She was with another guy. No. Was I concerned how my son was going to be raised? Yeah. yeah. Um, that was, but that's a, that was a different issue. That was a different yeah. issue. And, and for the most part, and I've had a lot of conversations with my son since, and it wasn't ideal. Yeah. And I didn't know some things that were yeah. less than ideal. I just never knew him till a year or two ago. Mm. Wow. Um, but my, my son's doing okay. My, 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 my son's all right. Uh, he's a good guy, good life, good dad. Um, so apparently wasn't too traumatized. He's probably more traumatized by his mother than the new guy that came into his life. Yeah, I'm sure the divorce in general was probably more more traumatic, and and I, all you, I think I'm all sure you, it was. I'm I sure think all, was. all you can do well too. It's it's not probably not as big an impact, but I think all you can do in those situations is just be the best dad you can when 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 it's your time to be that. I mean, you're always dad, but I mean when you yeah. have them in your custody, be a good that's, dad. You, that's all you can do, right? Uh, this one is an interesting one. So it, it's so, sort of about being a nice guy. It says since nice guys do too much to try to women's to try to win women's affection. How do you know if you're still in that mindset in your next relationship? Are you bringing her flowers, doing little things for her in a healthy way, or because you're still thinking that she'll give you the love and respect you want if you do more for her? So I guess there's a there's a line there. I mean, let me ask you this: Do you buy flowers and gifts for your wife, current your current wife? For my current wife, she buys me flowers more than I do. Um, <laughs> All right, that's cool. Do I give my wife gifts? Yeah, she wears Lululemon. She flies first class. Um, she, I rented her a vehicle to drive to Guadalajara this weekend because our, our our Honda Pilot needed some repair. I, I take good care of her. Yeah. Um, but one of the rules, like I said, when I started dating, I made a lot of rules for myself because, um, and this kind of like ruminating brain. You got to know where your ruminating brain tends to go off and ruminate so you can be aware of it. You need to know where you get caught up in giving and pleasing behaviors to make somebody like you. And so you cannot do them, right? Because they're, 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 again, most of his behavior is very unconscious. So like, for example, while I was still married to my second wife, I was in therapy. Um, I realized I was, I was giving a lot gifts otherwise to make her happy, to make her love me, to make her want to have sex with me. Sure. And, um, you know, processing that with my therapist and with her. Um, I went on a year moratorium where I did not give any gifts, no greeting cards, no, no gifts, only, only things my children needed. Mm. I had to get sober of giving to get, and it made me a lot more conscious of my giving process. Mm. So like then when I started dating and then started teaching men about dating, I said, do not give gifts, do not give surprises, do not do special things, do not go on weekend long, you know, dates on your second and third date. I I learned, for example, that I could not take a woman on a first, second or third date and take her to do things I liked. For example, I couldn't take her to a concert at the winery outdoor where I cook us a great meal and spread it out on the lawn and have a bottle or two of wine and listen to classic rock or, you know, all blue sky. I couldn't do that because they fell in love with that. Mm. Right? They fell in love with the experience of being with me as I just, you know, I've done all those things by myself many times. If I didn't have a date, I'd either just sell the ticket at the gate or, you know, I'd go on Craigslist and say, I got a ticket. Who wants to come be, you know, my partner for a great concert? Uh, I, you know, I'd, I'd make fun. I'd have fun with it, yeah. but I, I would do this anyway. So I learned there are a lot of things I couldn't do early on. So I didn't because, okay, if I take a woman on a second date to the winery and we have this great meal, great time, and every, you know, good wine, blah, blah. And she gets to ride in my Mercedes or whatever. Yeah. Is she going to fall in love with that experience? Often they did. Um, so I, I made myself go slower. First three dates were a coffee date, a walk in the park date, 
a maybe a glass of wine at happy hour date, a make or ride a bus to a baseball game where I would buy a ticket from a scalper on a bicycle date. You know, I, I do stuff like that to find out more what is her nature. Because I tell guys, and, and maybe this is a good place to wrap it up here. I tell guys the purpose of dating is not to get a woman to like you, it's not to get laid, it's not to get a girlfriend, it's not to find you know the future mother of your kids. The, few, the purpose of dating is to find out as quickly as possible, or uh, to go slowly as possible, to find out as quickly as possible, what's her nature and how does she fit into your great life? You need to be constantly asking, what is her nature? You don't find out her nature by giving her gifts, buying her surprises, having, you know, amazing dates, you know, weekend trips, you don't find out her nature. You find out her nature by taking her on public transportation, by spending time around her friends and family, by bringing her around your friends and family, by seeing how she treats waiters and shop mm. people. You, your job, and I think it takes at least three years of conscious work to get to know the depth of a person's nature because mm. with every woman i've been with right around three years they revealed something to me i thought i'm just now getting to see this mm, right you know um you know without being too cynical everybody shows up to date and they're all being fake everybody oh, yeah. everybody's you know saying you know what do i do to get this guy to, <laughs> or this girl to approve of me either way yeah. and um so three years of conscious asking yourself, what is this person's nature and how does she fit into my life, right? So that means any gift giving, flowers, special events that you think are going to impress her, you're already going down, you're going the wrong direction, yeah. going the wrong direction. Does that mean, you know, you never do anything nice for them? No. But man, you better be paying real close attention every time you're getting emotional mileage out of thinking, oh, she's going to love this. This is going to be so cool. When I send flowers to her workplace and all her coworkers are going to see, oh, she got flowers. This guy must be amazing. No, fuck that shit. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do it. Right. It's yeah. just you thinking she'll think I'm so great. No, that's not what we're doing. We're finding out what's her nature and how does she fit into your life. Yeah. Amen. All right. Well, thank you again for doing this, Dr. Glover. I really appreciate it. Um, it's been fun. Yeah. The last question I ask everybody is what words of wisdom would you impart to a man who's just starting his divorce process? It's just starting his divorce process. Lawyer up. Lawyer up. <laughs> um, I, I, I have a blog, uh, a blog post uh, I wrote a few years back on 10 rules for going through divorce. Hmm. Lawyer up is two of them. <laughs> <laughs> nice guys tend to think oh we'll be amicable oh, yeah. i don't want to spend the money well you yeah. know you know maybe we'll just get you know i'll manipulate covert contract my way yeah. through it lawyer up yeah lawyer. amen i couldn't agree more thank you again for doing it what's the best uh way for people to reach you and, and your book and, and your programs how, how do they get in touch with you and, and all well, you're doing you can find any of my books on Amazon, uh, No More Mr. Nice Guy, Dating Essentials for Men, Dating Essentials for Men, FAQ, The Big Stick, most recent book, all, all on Amazon. Uh, they can find me online at drglover.com, D-R-G-L-O-V-E-R.com, integrationnation.net, uh, integrationnation.net for my, my new membership men's program. Um, any of those places, if they just Google no more Mr. Nice Guy or Robert Glover. I got all the top spots. Awesome. Thank you again for doing this, sir. I really appreciate it. Michael, this was so much fun. Thanks for it the invitation. Was. Thank you, sir. Take care. Thank you so much for watching and or listening. Since my separation in July of 2019, I have done an incredible amount of work on myself. I've had many different therapists, life coaches, and went through different programs. I've taken all that I've learned and put it into my own program called Forged by Fire. If you are interested in having me help you navigate your divorce, please hit my website, risingphoenixdivorcecoach.com. I look forward to working with you.